Greetings from First Presbyterian Church of Bonita Springs. My name is Stephen Grant. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church, and I would like to welcome you to another edition of our Dialogues program. And today, we have the great pleasure and honor to welcome a dear friend of mine, as well as one of my mentors, my brother in Christ, Dr. Peter Lilbeck. Peter, welcome. Well, Dr. Grant, what an honor to be with you. It's the first time I could call you Dr. Grant on a television program. How about that? Yes, because <laughs> I did earn my doctorate of ministry degree from Westminster Theological Seminary, where Dr. Lilbeck serves as president. And he was also my mentor through the program, which was no small task, was it? You were an <laughs> outstanding student. That's why I'm here. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, uh, Dr. Lobeck, I really have to say, and you've heard me say it before, next to marrying my wife, the smartest thing I ever did was to, to work on my doctorate degree at Westminster Seminary. Well, we what really appreciate it. If, if only we had all alumni like you, that would be great. <laughs> well, it's uh, a great pleasure, my friend, to welcome you today. And uh, one of the reasons why you're in our area was that we just had the joy of um, hosting Westminster Seminary in a seminar that the school offered to us called Faith in the Public Square. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can say more about that as we go along. But um, as you and I talked about that event and all the material that was discussed, uh, we happened on the subject of personal evangelism. And I mm -hmm. thought that maybe today this might be an interesting topic for us to discuss. Right. Uh, I fear that uh, many Christians are a little intimidated by the E word, evangelism, because they have the impression that that means going around and knocking on doors and annoying people or um, uh, speaking in front of a big crowd like a Billy Graham and they don't see themselves doing that. But that's not what we're talking about though, is it? Not at all. You know, it's interesting. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, his young understudy, and, and he didn't say, you better be an evangelist. He said something very different. He said, do the work of an evangelist. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that, that means none of us get off the hook. <laughs> That's right. We're supposed to do the work of an evangelist. Now, That's we part all, of our Christian call. It is. In other words, not everybody is going to be a Stephen Grant who's a pastor trained to preach and teach. Not everyone is going to be like a James Kennedy that showed how people could share the gospel with people that now has a ministry around the world. But every one of us believe in the good news if we are Christians. Good news, gospel, same thing. And so an evangelist is someone that says, I just want people to know there's good news in this world. And if ever there was a time we need to hear that is this time of the global pandemic where all we hear is bad news. That's right. And, but the good news has not disappeared. And that can be as simple as saying, listen, I want you to come and hear the gospel with me at my church on Sunday. It could be giving someone, like I often do, I bring along a little co uh, copy of the Gospel of John. I'm someone to say, can I share some really good news with you? It's just that easy. It may be, as it is sometimes, you're in a hospital room or you're at work and someone says, I've just gone through the biggest disaster in my life. I've got a diagnosis or my family's falling apart and you have a chance to pray with them and say, you know, Jesus said, I'll never leave you and never forsake you. Can I just pray with you and tell you the hope? We don't know how the Lord will open the, up the door, but good news is welcome anytime in a bad news world. Well, that's world. a very key part of this, I think, is that we don't necessarily have to have the burden on us to think that we're going to convert somebody in one encounter or one in conversation, but that we plant seeds. And so uh, it, it, it's amazing the number of times that I've found anyway the number of times the other person actually opens the door a mile wide by asking a question. That's great. If they find out I'm a pastor or they find out that um, I go to Bible studies and whatever, they bring it up and say, what does your Bible say about? And then why we, should we be reluctant to want to answer? That's great. There's a great opportunity because they've raised the topic. Yep. There are uh, examples in my own ministry and in my life where someone says, you know what? You're the fourth person that's told me about this in the last month. I wonder if God's trying to get a hold of me. <laughs> so the Bible says some sow, some water, but God gives the increase. And once you realize the fruit of new life is God's work, and we just have the joy of planting seeds. Well, if you like gardening, you ought to be a great evangelist. <laughs> that's right. If you water your lawn, you ought to be a great evangelist. 
In other words, it's just keeping the process going of keeping the good news in front of people. But I think that's a bit, another very important point that you bring up is that we also recognize that we may be a part of a much larger uh, group of people, God's team, that uh, has uh, an opportunity to plant seeds in that person's life. That's so right. as you said, that person may say, you know, you're the fourth person that mentioned this. Or you're maybe the tenth person that's mentioned <laughs> this. And again, the burden isn't on us to uh, convert this person, but we're planting seeds and you let the Holy Spirit then, what he does with it is amazing. That's right. And so that's why that analogy of scripture is so powerful. It says, he that sows uh, in a little will only reap a little. He that sows plentifully will have a harvest. That's extraordinary. And so the goal is not, do I see the fruit? The goal is, am I planting the seed? Am I sharing the good news? And the wonderful thing is that we don't know how God will use that testimony or that report or that good word or that verse of scripture that we shared with somebody. Well, one of the scripture passages that have come to me, well, there's so much of scripture that uh, we could be here all day talking about the scriptures that have impacted us. But one that I'm thinking of at this moment is when Jesus fed the 5,000. And uh, he didn't let the disciples off the hook. He said, you give them something to eat. And they said, well, we can't do this. What have we got? I said, well, what do you have? Yeah. And when you take whatever you have and you put it in the hands of Jesus, the miracles happen. You That's watch right. what he does with it. So if, if, even if it's just a brief encounter, a little encouraged, like you say, the person who's going through a real tough time and you just plant that seed that the, the Lord Jesus loves you, is this person now converted and they're now going to be a full-fledged member of your church? Not in that moment. But what will God do with that one little seed that you planted? Stephen, as you speak, you remind me of a story that's true. I won't give all the names. But several years ago, there was a professor who didn't get tenure. Hmm. That's a huge deal. You've worked right. hard and you don't get it. Whatever uh, had happened in his life, I don't know. But he was now dealing with that difficulty. And at the same time, his marriage fell apart. Oh, oh. So now can you imagine you're going to your office, you don't get tenure, you can't go home because you don't have a family now, and you're boxing up your things and you're leaving and you're not sure where you're going. And as this professor was getting ready to leave, there was a, a young African-American lady, a very fine secretary, that said, Professor, you really look sad. You need to pray to Jesus. He will help you. That's all she said. Of course, he scoffed at that and he boxed up his stuff and he started driving from the West Coast to the East Coast. And he was so distraught that halfway across America, he said, my life is over. I'm done. He was in a hotel room all by himself and said, it's time just to end it. What a waste. And then he heard in those words, in his mind, I need to look to Jesus. He said, and he said, I wonder if there's a Gideon's Bible in this room. And so wouldn't you know, he opened up the drawer, he found a Gideon's, he started to read. And he discovered that simple truth of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will never perish, but has everlasting life. And in his despair, this PhD scholar, now life in a mess, said, Jesus, I need you. He was converted. Isn't that amazing? And so as he kept on driving, he ended up getting to the East Coast. And he started to rebuild his life. And he started working on, on the note cards of the book. And he actually took a title from the Bible for his book called The Heavens and the Earth. And it became a Pulitzer Prize winning wow. book. And he is now a full professor at the University of Pennsylvania. That's amazing. Now, isn't that remarkable? That is. It's a perfect but that's a, illustration. That's the kind of thing that God does. It's just a little seed of the name of Christ, Jesus. You ought to pray to Jesus. He did. And his life changed. He rebuilt his life, and the Lord has used him in a remarkable way. But also what strikes me about that story, actually, is the secretary. Because when she shared that with him, that was something that was coming from her heart. Yep. And the more I think about, really, the essence of evangelism, it takes me back to really my relationship with Jesus, because being a Christian is more than just having a set of opinions about things. You know, I'm willing to accept certain doctrines, but that really I have a relationship with him. He's the one, he's the Lord of my life, so he's the one who shapes who I am. He uh, has uh, sovereignty over everything I do, everything I think, everything I am. He's what's make me tick, right? right? 
And so it's what brings joy to my life. It's what defines my life. So since, so that's what he means to me. Why would I not want to share it with somebody else? I think about how many times have people, you probably do this yourself, you got pictures of your grandkids in your pocket, yeah. right? <laughs> and even if the other person doesn't ask for it, you go, let me show you this cute yeah. little picture of my grandkids. <laughs> well, because it, because it brings such joy to you right. and it's something that's important to you and you yeah. want to share it with other people. Why not, why, why not share Jesus in the same way? That is if, if he well is said. the most important one yeah. in our life, why would we not want to share? That's good. Well, good news is something that you really do want to share if you care about the person that's around you. So I think uh, the question we need to ask is, is Jesus good news to you? And if he mm -hmm. isn't, then you need to say, do you understand what his cross is all about? That the full weight of God's wrath of, for your sin was taken on him on the cross and that he has given his perfect life of righteousness to us that's received, as Luther says, by the hands of a beggar receiving a gift from a king. And it's not just that we have his righteousness, he takes our sin, but his resurrection means that we have life that conquers death itself and he gives that to us. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. What are most of the things that give us great consternation? I'm sick, what's gonna happen next? What happens when I die? Jesus addresses the fact that this life, as short as it is, is only the beginning of life that never ends. And Christ says, he that believes in me has everlasting life. That's good news. That's Amen. good news that we need to preach to ourselves as Christians because on the worst day of our lives, this is not all that we have. The best is always yet to come for the mm. Christian. Mm -hmm. We've seen nothing yet. Paul says the suffering of this present time is not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you, Stephen, and in me, mm -hmm. and in you if you're listening today, if you put your faith in Christ. I'm always uh, uh, just full of joy when I read about Paul's joy. If you read the first chapter of uh, the book of Philippians, he's in jail. Yeah. And, all, and all he can think to write about is joy. Yeah. <laughs> that's that peace that passes understanding. Is that, yeah, that seems right. foolish to the world. So, but, uh, but because of that, is that even in a situation like that, he can write about joy. So there's, there's the wonderful reason to be a good news sharer. Because when you share the good news, you not only are blessing someone else, but you're reminding yourself of what really matters. Well, the topic of our conference this weekend uh, had, uh, had to do with the uh, concern that many of us had about how do we reach the next generations. And we see what's going on in, uh, in our country and in the world at large, but certainly in our own country. And there's a great concern about uh, the spreading of the faith and the foundations upon which our country is founded. And how do we reach the, uh, uh, the younger generation? So we talked about that in depth uh, at our conference. But I remember you sharing something wonderful. I, I, many in our audience are, uh, have hair like we do, which means we've got kids and grandkids. And um, could you share with us a little bit about some of the advice that you shared about what we can do in our own families um, uh, in addressing this concern that uh, even warranted a whole conference? That's great. Well, one of the things I did is I reminded our listeners of how the scriptures talk about how one generation will praise the name of the Lord to another generation. That intergenerational ministry, it runs right through the scriptures in many places. But in this day in particular, we have the opportunity of capturing our faith, preserving it even for a generation that's unborn. So I'll give everybody an opportunity. Are you used to having meetings on Zoom? Well, almost everybody has to use Zoom today because we haven't been able to get out of the house, right? That's right. We're connecting. Well, Zoom has a recording function. And that means you have the opportunity to sit down and talk to someone and your conversation is recorded. And more than that, you also have the ability now through Zoom to have that transcribed. So you can actually have the conversation that's been communicated put in written form. Well, here's a couple or three great tools that if you just think about it, you could use to preserve, to talk to your grandchildren. And maybe you say, I'm going to be here for maybe another five or 10 years. I don't think I'll get to see them on their wedding day or when they graduate from college. Mm -hmm. But you can be there. That's right. You could sit down with your family and say, you know what? I have something I've recorded that I want to give to my grandchild on that special day. Couldn't you just imagine it and saying, 
I so wish I could have been here at your wedding. But because it's unlikely I will be, I just wanted you to know, I've been praying for this day long before you met the person you're marrying. And you share your heart. And another example is to share your, your faith and say, I don't know what you're going to face in the future, but this is a verse that I've claimed for you. And we can mm -hmm. record that and preserve it. So I encouraged everybody to create their family testimony that is passed on to generation to generation. Here's an, an example why. Through the years, I've met people who I've asked, are, are your mom and dad Christian? said, no, I came from a non-Christian family. I came to faith on my own. He said, but I've done a genealogy, and I went back and I discovered five generations back, there was a minister of the gospel in my family. Oh, wow. I said, I bet he was praying for me way back then. <clears throat> and that's true. Christians pray for the future generations of their family. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it have been great if he could have said, I don't know what the future holds, but I have a word for you. Well, why not plan for that? Mm -hmm. We can do that. And uh, so, so the idea of leaving a legacy, and so often we think about the legacy in terms of an inheritance or property that's given. But we have a spiritual legacy that we can pass on generation to generation. And so I've even urged people that have the ability to sit down and write a small book of their faith for their family. Mm -hmm. Self-publishing is easy these days. Right. I have a couple friends who have done a book for their children. One is, one is called Remember. He shared it with me. He's got teenage kids and he's sat down and he said, I want to give you something that you'll think about in years to come. I know another man who has children, grandchildren, and he sat down and told his life story and how faith has shaped him so that he could just have it for others. Many ways we can do it, but probably the best way of all, and it's grandparents with grandkids are especially powerful. When you pick up those grandkids in there on your lap, just say, I want you to know I love Jesus. I want you to, to know him. Mm -hmm. I'm praying for you. Just a simple witness like that. That's passing on the legacy and the good news. But isn't that wonderful that we do have the wonder of technology now? That's right. uh, I, as you were talking, I was reminded of, uh, there's a lady gave a testimony once um, that a couple of months after she lost her son. And she was having a particularly bad day in God's providence. She just happened to pull this book off the shelf in the family home. <clears throat> she opened it up and there was a card in there. And apparently the son had written down something on this card, put, stuck it in the book and forgot about it, and it was there all along. And just when she needed it most, she opened it up and it said, uh, Mom, when you read this, know how much I love you. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that was just on a card. Well, in the same way, just think years down the road uh, when uh, a young person uh, decides, you know what, what is that video that Grandpa made for me? I wonder what he said. And there it is years later. What a beautiful legacy of, yeah. of expression of love, expression of faith, expression of experience, wisdom, all those things that we can pass on. Amen. But you said something about that, uh, and, and I think all of us need to take seriously, and, and me included, is the uh, idea that, yeah, you know, I'm going to get to that at some point. That sounds like a great idea. And then that day never comes. We don't get to it. We really have to intentionally say, Put it on the calendar. On this day, I'm going to record that. I'm going to do that. Otherwise, time will pass by and we may never get to it. That's right. The so famous how saying, important that we really make that commitment and do it. Yeah, that famous saying of St. Augustine is, by and by never comes. <laughs> That's exactly right. So today, sit down and look at your calendar and say, do I really want my family to know this good news? Maybe they don't want to talk about spiritual things now, but this isn't the only moment that they have a chance. But you could begin to preserve that in a simple and clear way for a future day. Make a commitment. Share that. That's right. Yeah. Well, I, I hope that from all of this, as all of you are listening to this, that uh, the E word, evangelism, is not something that uh, should be intimidating to us. But it should be something that we are all called to do. And that um, uh, it, it's just simply as a matter of sharing your heart with someone else. It's not something we have to force on anybody. It's not something that um, uh, we have to manipulate somebody, but you just offer it to somebody as a gift, just as at some point in your life, they offered it to you. Well, Dr. Lilbeck, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, I want to thank so you for Dr. your Grant. wisdom. And uh, hopefully the next time you're in our area, I'd love to uh, meet with you again. And let's do another one of these and it's, talk about uh, we, another I, topic. I'll accept your invitation. You just let me know when. That, that would be <laughs> awesome. 
Well, thank you for tuning in to this edition of Dialogues. And uh, stay tuned and check our website at First Presbyterian Church for other interviews that uh, have already been recorded and certainly ones that will be recorded in the future. Well, God bless you, and thank you for tuning in. Bye for now. Bye.